Photography Daily. Yes, I tiptoe downstairs. I have my cycling gear all sitting on the kitchen table next to my camera bag and dress quietly, slip out the door, wheel the bike out the garden shed and uh, head off down the street. Oh, you'll love this story as an opener to the week because when I chatted with National Geographic contributor, writer, photographer, Rolf Smith, after my chat, I entirely got the concept of slowing down and observing what is on my doorstep as a possible photo story. There's more to be seen than just going by at 35 miles in a car. Rolf Smith is more used to being on a jetliner, travelling to his next story than being within a 10-mile radius of his home on the south coast of England. But he was featured recently by the New York Times for his wonderful lockdown-enforced project, where the lanes around his home became his muse. Every day he'd cycle for sometimes hours to make self-portraits, and pictures of his journey, leaving his camera in the open while he builds a narrative for his compositions, which got me worried about Kit. Now, in the small lanes that I'm on, the chances of theft are are, are minuscule, really, because there's just nobody there. I do worry about, you know, the, the farmer Land Rover who comes racing around the curve and high, you know, high winds. You know, you're leaving the expensive camera sitting on a tripod where you ride away. It's been a photo project which we'll share on the show page that's been a joy and still ongoing but equally a workout in rain, shine, snow, the dark and anything else Mother Nature can throw. I had to go up and down this 14% grade trying to get this shot that I wanted and um, you know it was pretty brutal. By the time I finished, I was uh, very ready to be home. Roth is no stranger to two wheels, as we'll learn. If, funnily enough, my um, first story for National Geographic was a three-part series uh, on a bicycle journey I made around Australia. And that that sort of launched my career in, in National Geographic. Cycling thousands of miles in temperatures only the critters enjoy. It's tough work. People were telling me in Broome there is nothing out there. You know, and people were telling me, you know, you're, you're going to die. Don't do this. Yeah. And by the, by the time I'd gotten to Broome, I'd already ridden about 6,000 miles through pretty rough outback. So I had a pretty good idea that, you know, that it wasn't going to be easy. And then we learn about writing for National Geo 2, including a story that caught my eye about London cabbies. Uh, it takes years to learn London that way. And the effort of of memorizing this much actually uh, literally changes the brains of people who've done this. It's a story of travel today, of working for one of the most respected publications on the planet, of finding the simplest things can enthrall an audience all across the world, ideas that are within a, a cycle ride of your own front door. Stories of life told by photographers. And today that photographer is Rolf Smith. You learn about how to appreciate travel. And you don't really need to get on a plane and go to the other side of the world to experience a a sense of the romance of difference. Patron of the day today is Steve Brand. Insta address Steve B underscore photo 365, which I'll link to as well in the show notes. He started a 365 for the first time in February of this year. Who says you have to start in January? And you can see how he's getting along on his Insta grid. I spied a couple of interesting bits in there, Steve. A red phone box in the middle of a farmer's field, which had me proper perplexed. A sign of the times as Dr Kate delivers your vaccine and some wonderful sunsets bringing in your next 365 shot. For the price of a fancy large latte per month, patrons are helping to build and keep this podcast here. All patrons get to hear the extra private Tuesday and Thursday shows. And tomorrow, in time for a special on Wednesday about shooting portraits and adding sound when we talk to Robert Gumpert about his extraordinary project made in county jails, I thought I'd run through my own sound setup when it comes to capturing the texture of sound on the street to accompany your wonderful pictures that you make, using sound to give your stories a further dimension. We're also supported by MPB.com, the number one platform when it comes to trust for buying and selling and trading used camera gear in the US, the UK or Europe. And I think it's important to add that it's a, a service I personally use. I've bought used camera gear through them because I like the idea of a guarantee. I've sold kit I no longer use through them, and I've traded gear in against equipment I really want to add to my kit bag. And I've put my money where my mouth is. As the weekend just gone, I ordered uh, another camera in time for the, the wedding season. Starting up, 
in just under two months now. He says, I don't know whether it's nervously or with anticipation or I'm just so pleased to see it coming. So, Roth Smith, he is a photographer, a writer, a contributor for National Geographic in its many guises and has been now for a number of years. So I'm fascinated to find out more about how that came about, how you go about approaching shooting and writing for this powerhouse publication. But, you know, I was made aware of his work only very recently, following the, the New York Times publishing a piece about a photo project that is proof that you really don't need to go too far from your front door to make stories that the world's most important titles are keen to talk about. I think it's too easy to think that you need something exceptionally complex, difficult to pull off, for it to be worthy of shooting or attract attention. Sometimes the simplest stories are just the best. This is a story about a photographer who takes a real pleasure in following his instincts to make photo stories and create intriguing assignments for himself. This is a story about Roth Smith. Every morning I set off on a journey, up at Sparrows, down the street on my bicycle, exercising my imagination as much as my legs. By the time I returned to the house an hour or two later, having witnessed the sunrise and put however many miles of town and country beneath my wheels, I feel as though I've been places, seen things, travelled in the grand old sense of the word. This, Roth, sounds like the perfect breakfast. but And, and it's not just fair weather. I mean, you get out there whatever the weather, don't you? I, I do. I, I've been out in some very cold, um, bitter temperatures. Yeah. There are a couple of things that keep me home. We, uh, here on the coast, we get some really savage winds. And, you know, if your winds are going 50 miles an hour coming off the sea, there's no point in riding. You're, you're just going to get blown off the bike. Mm. Um, but otherwise, yeah, temperature makes very little difference to me. And, you know, there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. <laughs> and and you get up, uh, I mean, you... You literally get up. I mean, you say here with the sparrows. It's before the sparrows, frankly. Because yeah, I'm, I, yes, I'm out on the road and they're just waking up. Yeah. In the summer, I leave it. As, I can leave as early as three o'clock in the morning. Wow. In winter, uh, when the sun is up later, I might leave like five. Yeah. Five thirty sometimes. That's when I get to sleep in. And you do have family, so I, I, yeah. I assume you're trying not to wake those up as you're leaving the house at four thirty yes. in the morning. Yes, I tiptoe downstairs. <laughs> I have my cycling gear all sitting on the kitchen table next to my camera bag and dress quietly. Slip out the door, wheel the bike out the garden shed, and uh, head off down the street. Um, it's always dark when I leave. That means you've got um, an incredible internal clock as well that must know what time of the day it is. Well, I've always been an early morning person, although since I've started doing this particular project, I've become a very, very early morning person. <laughs> in the summer, like I say, um, I'll leave the house at three o'clock in the morning so I can be maybe an hour, hour and a half away um, mm -hmm. when the sun comes up at a place I've already worked out where I want to be. So it's, um, yeah, it takes a lot of, there are, there are some mornings when you just lay there and you think, I really don't want to get up. <laughs> So the project itself, though, is, I mean, that's the result of not being, and we're going to talk a lot about your travelling, but that's, that's the result of not being able to, to take your regular travel pattern around the globe, isn't it? Yeah, I had just, I'd been in South America. I was uh, shooting a series on the uh, great last, really, of the great Panama hat weavers in Ecuador. Oh, yeah, in Ecuador. Yes, I read that. And um, I literally finished that, left uh, Ecuador, and flew back. COVID was just starting to sort of rage around the globe. And I literally got in here just before the lockdown. I mean, literally. So I, you know, that was my last, my last trip. And I've uh, been really no further than where I've been on my bicycle in the year and a bit since then. So did, did you like the rest of us think, well, we'll, we'll if you forgive the pun now, uh, ride this out for the next couple of months? Uh, and then well, we'll, yeah. be, we'll be back I, I out again. They said it could be four months. And I yeah. was thinking that's ridiculous. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> that's well over a year ago now. But uh, yeah, no, I thought it would, I didn't, never dreamed it would last this long. So look, you take your camera and your tripod with you, and, yes. and you you make essentially self portraits. And I did read that you, you it took a little while to get used to it because generally you were happier the other side of the camera than in, than in front of it. <laughs> But take me through the process. I assume you're not taking too much out with you because you're, you're riding extraordinary miles on some days. 
Yeah, well, the pack is pretty heavy. I have a um, full frame DSLR and um, a couple of Canon lenses and a couple of Zeiss lenses, and then was they're a bit weighty. And uh, then I take uh, some spare caps, a spare jersey, so I have different colors and for to work with the backdrops. Some of this stuff has evolved over the year, uh, where I'm taking more stuff now than I did at the beginning because I I know what I'm looking for now. So things like the the different color tops, I wouldn't imagine you knew that from day one, did you? It, no, it only no, occurred no. to you later on. You thought, oh, hang on, that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't go, doesn't go so well with that that uh, field of rape, I am rape a seed. ruthless critic of my own work. <laughs> I bet. And I get home and I look at stuff and I study it very closely, yeah. and um, very critically. And you know, I've, I've I've gone back to reshoot things uh, plenty of times where I look and I read. In fact, I did it just the other day. I realized I, the jersey I was wearing just simply wasn't right. It just didn't work with the backdrop. And you just wait until you get a similar sort of light and then try and go back and do it. Uh, the most extreme example of this wasn't with the jersey so much, but with the simple dissatisfaction of my perspective on a, on a scene. I had really wanted to get this stretch of lane with some huge old oaks in heavy frost. Yeah. And there was a morning when it was about five, minus five, and I rode by starlight about an hour and a quarter, hour and a half to get to this place. Freezing. I mean, it was cold. Yeah. And I spent half an hour, 45 minutes shooting this particular scene, rode back home feeling fairly satisfied. And I looked at it and I could just see that the camera angle was just, I needed to have lowered the camera a quarter of an inch and it would have made all the difference. And I couldn't look at those images because it bugged me. So the next morning, it was fortunately still very clear, bitterly cold, I rode all the way back out there, redid the shoot, came home. This time, thank goodness, I was satisfied. But um, yeah, it, I'm I'm a very stern critic of my own work. And looking at the bike, um, it it appears that that your camera bag is always squashed in, but just below the saddle. Ah, uh, that's a that's where that's where I keep my my tools, my spare. Ah, uh, um, okay. You know, the camera bag is. A hefty old brute. It's on my shoulder. Oh, it's actually on your shoulder, right? Okay. Oh yeah. It appears to me as well that you're always sort of flashing past the camera. I know that might be the the uh, the way you want it to look. I did. I, I I found myself getting a bit concerned, Roth, about your kit. Uh, I was thinking, well, it's it's often across the road, up a hill, down a hill, across a field, nowhere mm -hmm. near nowhere near Roth on occasions. Um, mm. ne never mind the technical. I mean, I know the technical thing of being able to take selfies. Um, you're using an intervalometer, so that that works. Yeah. But but sometimes you're a, you're a long way away from your kit. Uh, there there there's obviously you know some risks in doing this because um, now in the small lanes that I'm on, the chances of theft are are, are minuscule really because there's just nobody there. I do worry about you know the the farmer Land Rover who comes racing around the curve and high you know high winds. You know you're leaving the expensive camera sitting on a tripod where you ride away so there is those concerns and then on, in some of the seafront towns where i've been shooting yes there is certainly concern there, there have been times where i've started to set up and just seen some people coming along the promenade when it's cold and they're shirtless and carrying uh cans of beer you just think no maybe this not isn't today. a good look no. uh so i you know there, there are days when i just have to just pull in my horns and 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 skip something i would assume actually this has been very good for you uh in health terms over the last 12 months oh uh, well y yes and no. <laughs> yeah yeah actually <laughs> Um, it's a workout uh, every day. Yeah. Well, see, in the winter, I've, I've tended to go out in the marsh a lot, partly because it's flat and um, going downhill when it's icy is not such a great thing. No. Um, on the marsh, I know that road extremely well. And, and the marsh is incredibly reliable for good light, really reliable. Mm. Uh, lately, I've been going back up into the wheel on those narrow sunken lanes. It's much harder to shoot there. And um, I'm noticing the hills this last last couple of weeks, I've really noticed the hills when I've been going out in the mornings. So, because some of those are 14, 16, 18% grades. Yeah, and, yeah. and if you're shooting on them, I mean, there's one I was shooting the other day, I, I had to go up and down this 14% grade trying to get this shot that I wanted. And, um, you know, it was pretty brutal. By the time I finished, I was uh, very ready to be home. Well, you live in St. Leonard's on Sea, which which you describe. I've seen you write this as faded elegance in terms of well, where it once yeah. was as part of, if you want to call it Brit Britain's Costa, which I think you did before before yeah. you you commented people went to the real Costa in Spain. Is, yeah. it, is it a place that you appreciate more now? Now that absolutely you've, you've made it your photographic muse over the last year, haven't you? Really? Yeah. Um. You know, you. I think. 
uh, it's been a real education in in what y- you look for in travel because we, we're so used to seeing things around us we don't we don't notice them and um, you know St Leonard's and Sea was just you know it's, it's I, I knew it as a place where you you know the supermarket the you know the post office you know that kind of thing but now I've started to uh, see it as um, it, it's it's a really quite an interesting and quite a beautiful place um, in some ways I don't really feel the I don't miss traveling that much because I genuinely feel as though I'm traveling somewhere every day. I mean, I, I, I notice the, um, I, I mean, I know the sunrise time, the phases of the moon, the tide tables, yeah. uh, loads of things that I would never have given thought to before. But you also you learn about how to appreciate travel. And you don't really need to get on a plane and go to the other side of the world to experience a sense of the romance of difference. I'll come back to the bike in a moment. Um, I know you've got lots of experience on a bike. Uh, but I think, yes. I think you have the idyllic working life, really. Pandemic notwithstanding, to throw a spanner in the works. Well, but, income uh, notwithstanding, yeah, and, uh, Yes, maybe income as well. <laughs> Photographers all together on that one. Th- yeah. 30 years writing, though, and travelling around the world. The last yeah. 20, much of it for National Geographic in its various forms. How on earth does a career like that start? Precariously. Um, I started off, I was working with the uh, Sydney Morning Herald many years ago and then the Melbourne Age. And from there, I sort of segued into uh, Time magazine. I was a, a senior writer there. But National Geographic had always been a, a sort of a childhood dream. Yeah. And um, funnily enough, my um, first story for National Geographic was a three part series uh, on a bicycle journey I made around Australia. And that that sort of launched my career in, in National Geographic. Um, it was almost an accidental launch. I had wanted to take stock of my life, and I, I decided to sort of quit my job at time and ride around Australia. And I, I'd mentioned this to some people I knew at National Geographic, and they were you know intrigued by it. And I, I started sending them letters back from these are the days of snail mail, and um, this was 1996. And I was sending them letters from the road, and, and that that's how this this grew into a, a three part series in the magazine, and then became a book, and then. It sort of launched my career with National Geographic. And I, I was quite touched when I, I finished this trek around Australia. I came all the way back to Sydney, and I was at the Opera House where, I, where I'd started nine months earlier. Mm. And um, there was a, a photographer who came to took, take pictures of me as I came into the, uh, because this is before I knew how to take pictures of myself on a bike. And he brought this letter from the editor-in-chief. And the editor-in-chief had looked through the file because I had mentioned once as a kid, I had written to them saying how much I wanted to write for them one day. And the editor-in-chief had actually gone back and looked through the files, found my old letter. <laughs> and he wrote this absolutely, this guy named Bill Allen, he was the editor-in-chief at the time. He wrote this wonderful letter, you know, now you've arrived. And it was, it was a really touching, uh, wow. touching moment, really, to, to finish that and then get this letter where he, he looked up all this stuff and, and, and he addressed all the things that I talked about as a kid. And it was really, it was really lovely. You, you'd mentioned the Australian trip and I was going to come to it, but um, 10,000 miles solo bike expedition in Australia. Yes. <laughs> cold, cold beer and crocodiles, you called it. Um, That's right. I mean, it is one of the most beautiful places on earth, but uh, I mean, that kind of mileage is going to take you way inland to where it's hot. There are lots of crocs, lots of snakes, lots of heat. Oh, there was there was loads of there, <laughs> there was all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but um, there was one, I mean, wonderful experiences. When I left um, a place called um, Broome up in the northwest part of Australia, in Western Australia, mm. Old Pearling Port. And the next town from there was Port Hedland, which is over 400 miles away across the Great Sandy Desert. This was in summer. Temperatures were 45 to 50 degrees. Wow. Um, there's really, as people were telling me in Broome, there's nothing out there. You know, and people were telling me, you know, you're, you're going to die. Don't do this. Yeah. And by the, by the time I'd gotten to Broome, I'd already ridden about 6,000 miles through pretty rough outback. So I had a pretty good idea that, you know, that it wasn't going to be easy. But the funny thing was I set off. Before I set off from Broome, I, I found where there were some big cattle stations out there in the Great Sandy Desert. You know, these are million, multi-million acre spreads. And I telephoned them and I said, look, would it be all right if I stopped it and got some water from your place? And all of them were absolutely, of course. So what ended up, you know, it started off as being you know, 400 miles if you're going to die for sure, <laughs> turned into a 
kind of like a, 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 a two week extravaganza because every time I stopped for water at one of these little remote places, they would insist that I would stay for a few days and decide they had to fatten me up with steaks and everything else. And then while I would be there, someone else, it was an Aboriginal community, um, they invited me to stay with them. There was another, you know, three or four more um, cattle stations. It ended up taking me two weeks to do those 400 miles. And I actually put on about five pounds and got out of shape. Back with Roth in a moment. If you make films and slideshows or podcasts, you may like to know that the incredible music that's the creative glue, if you like, between features and guests is from a royalty-free website and music library called artlist.io. And you will find a link through our website to them, right at the top there. So if you need music and you want to pay one charge in a year to use hundreds upon hundreds of songs across all your projects, whether it's YouTube or portraits or Vimeo or weddings or podcasts or commercial jobs, this is what I personally recommend and I use day after day after day. And also a question. What do most camera ambassadors seem to have in common? Well, they use the Fundy Designer, the world's most powerful album design and IPS software to double their wedding and portrait revenue. So, Get the leading software used by the world's most profitable photographers for designing and selling albums, wall art collections, cards, studio magazines, and much, much more. You can download the free trial or save an extra 25% off with the discount code, which is Photography Daily. Right, back to Roth Smith. This really put you on the map as an expedition cyclist in many ways, didn't it? 10,000 miles it, it, across, it, it, across rather, yeah. the most gorgeous uh, countries in, in the world. And, and now you're an expedition cyclist. Yes. Um, and expedition cycling is actually quite a big thing, isn't it? It is now. When I was doing this in 96, 97, it was quite unusual. But, I mean, now you, you go on Instagram and you can find people – you, you name the country and you can find someone cycling through it. And it doesn't really matter how obscure or, or distant it is. But uh, 25 years ago, I mean, there were people out there, of course, but it wasn't anything like it is now. Mm. You know, I remember when I was in, uh, before this, I was uh, bicycle commuting in Melbourne. It was very rare, very rare to find someone cycle commuting. And I was working for the yeah. Melbourne Age. Yeah. And now, I mean, I was in Melbourne well, a couple of years ago, and, and you know, there's bicycles everywhere. Yeah. You know, people yeah. commuting, bicycle paths, you know, it, it's a big thing now. It wasn't then. You, you, you've told these stories. I mean, obviously, you've written these stories for, for National Geo and, and other magazines. But you, you've also toured these on uh, cruise ships, I was reading. I can't, I can't imagine Roth Smith on a cruise ship. I would imagine you'd, you'd, miss, uh, you'd miss your early morning rides. You'd be going to... Well, I do miss the early morning rides. And I say a cruise ship, I guess the term they use is expedition ship. Right. These were places that went to very remote spots. They weren't the, they weren't the big ships. These are ships with maybe 100 passengers. The ship itself, it could be, you know, you know, if you're looking at some of those really big cruise ships, the, the kind of ships I was on was, you know, not, you know, it's practically a lifeboat on some of those other ones. Yeah. You know, these are ones that go down to Antarctica right. or just uh, really, you know, I, I've done a lot in Antarctica. Uh, in fact, I've even ridden a bicycle in Antarctica. What? Have you? Yes, I was uh, on an assignment uh, for National Geographic at the South Pole about 20 years ago. Ah, was this the vanishing frontier? Yeah, uh, yes. Yes. I went down there and, you know, there's a base at the South Pole. The uh, U.S. have had a base there since the 1950s. And um, I borrowed a um, mountain bike from uh, an astrophysicist who was working there. And he would pedal <laughs> his mountain bike a half mile over to the uh, observatory. And um, so I went and rode around the world at the South Pole, because if you go to the South Pole itself, you can cross every single line of longitude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So technically, I rode around the world in under ten seconds. But oh, um, yes, that was a ten seconds. The Guinness Book of World Records weren't, weren't really interested in my. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you did you put your name forward? Uh, no, I no. just looked at the uh, what they require, and I could see it was it was well short of um, you know they wanted a bit more suffering um, <laughs> and a lot more miles. I think it has to be something like eighteen or twenty thousand miles yeah. of cycling. Well, and so I think that, you know, a few meters in 10 seconds and then going inside for milk and cookies in the galley is probably not what they had in mind for, for world record uh, circuit navigations. It, no. well, it was fun. You, <laughs> it sure was fun. You mentioned Panama hats in Ecuador, yes. um, the Ant Antarctica story. Their water is, is life in Kenya. Um, I know some of these stories are commercial in nature and have co commercial uh, companies uh, behind them. 
Um, it is the photographic stuff of dreams, again, as I said before. Where, where I'm wondering where the ideas come from, where the commissions come from, whether it's them coming to you or you going to them with these super ideas. Well, it, it, it's both. Um, the uh, uh, Panama hats, um, I uh, know a, a guy who's a very, very high-end Panama hat dealer whose hats, he sells hats for, for many thousands of dollars. They, and the hats are just unbelievably finely woven. And um, I got really interested in the art of weaving the, these hats. And yeah, it's a, it's a collaborative art and it involves the weaver and, and all these other specialist artisans who do the finishing touches on these things. And you know, it, it's, it's a vanishing art. And I, I really wanted to capture it before it, it did, does vanish. I was shooting the, who was regarded by his peers as the world's finest living Panama hat weaver, mm. possibly the finest ever. And his hats will have over 4,000 weaves per square inch. You literally need a jeweler's loop to count the rows. Wow. And these aren't woven with a, with a loom. These are all done by you know, just using fingers and, and, uh, and a, a form around which you weave the hat. So I had this idea, and then I uh, approached the New York Times, and, and um, they really liked it and um, gave it a wonderful run. But, but why the New York Times? That, that, that's the bit I'm trying to join up the dots here. Then you think, look, I've got this great idea, Panama hats. Where, where's that thought process? Well, I, I happened to come across the, the name of the travel editor there, and I just thought I'd bounce it, bounce it off. Because I, 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 you know, New York Times is something I hadn't, I hadn't contributed to them before, and it's, it's something I really, you know, you know it's, it's funny. You, I, I've done a lot of stuff for National Geographic, but I, you know, I, I really wanted to have the New York Times on my CV too. Yeah, I mean, they're yeah. they're wonderful to work with. Yeah. Um, definitely, definitely high on my list to do more with them. Well, in terms of photographic stories, we, we've we've dealt with the cycling and and so on. But but I was reading some of the articles you'd written for National yeah. Geographic, and um, yes. it would seem, Roff, that we have the same fascination for those who do the knowledge. Um, did you, did, ah, yes. Did you ever see that wonderful film by the same name? By the way, I, got, I did, I, and I, I I absolutely did. And <laughs> isn't it is an amazing thing? I know. I mean, oh. as as you, as you say, if, if, you know, forget Mensa. This is yeah. this is one of the hard uh, for those that don't understand what what this is because this podcast goes around the world. Perhaps you should explain what the knowledge is. Well, London cab drivers to achieve your coveted green badge, which allows you to be a, a proper London cabbie, you have to literally memorize thousands, tens of thousands of streets. Byways. Yeah. You have to know the names of, of something like forty thousand um, landmarks, hospitals, shops. You have to be able to find your way between any two addresses within a six-mile <laughs> radius of Charing Cross by heart, without looking at a map, and recite the names of the yeah. roads. And it, you, you can't get a single thing wrong. No. Uh, it takes years to learn London that way, and the effort of, of memorizing this much actually uh, literally changes the brains of people who've done this. Does it? Yes. The hypoca hypochemists, I think it is, uh, it, they've done tests. So people who've passed the knowledge, their their brains have literally become in, enlarged. Um, their, their their memory capacity is, is, is phenomenal. It, it's just, I went around with some people who were doing the knowledge. And I mean, just in going with them, I learned more about the city than I ever dreamed I'd know. And, you know, I, I've, I've stayed friends with um, a couple of the people, I, 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 cabbies that I worked with and, and, and interviewed. And, and every time I go up to London, it just fascinates me to think that, you know, this friend was a friend of mine named Rob, who's a is one of the he's a cabbie. Any two addresses, you name it, he can he can tell you how to get from point to point without you know. I mean, you have to be able to rattle it off, and and you know, and they can do this. It's unlike anything else that's done, you know, in any other city in the world. I started asking cabbies um, one one question a couple of years back now, which I know it's a bit of a cliche one, but instead of saying, "Oh, what's the business like?" because you'd always have this great debate about Uber if you did, I, yeah. I, I started asking, "Give me a classic back of your cab story." <laughs> and, and they have these in, some. they have these incredible stories they, they don't mind telling you either <laughs> oh no yeah I, I interviewed yeah i mean that yeah i heard some heard some wonderful stories uh when i was, when I was doing this uh you know and it's something else that people don't know about those, those wonderful i suppose you, you you must have seen those old cabbie shelters the victorian yes, cabbie shelters yeah yeah the green ones yeah i mean yeah, again these are you know fascinating little parts of london history that people just don't realize yeah. I know. I know. Um, 
Uh, some of them have turned into uh, uh, tea bars, etc., for the public. Yes. Yeah, yes. these days. But um, I mean, the piece was called Manor House Station to Gibson Square. That, yes. that, that was the one you focused on. It's a really unfair question, because I, I, I'm, I'm not expecting you to have done the knowledge. But I did note it down here. Don't suppose you remember that run, do you? <laughs> I know where it is on the map. <laughs> <laughs> Could you even tell me the first part of the run? <laughs> no, it's, it's been a few years, and uh, I, I, I did memorize that at one point, so I could did actually you? recite uh, it, um, because but, I thought I should learn that one anyway. But can you imagine? They'd but, have to do 360 more. Yeah, and then you have to do little circles around each one of those That's points. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's insane. I mean, it is, you know, I, I, again, I heard some some very funny stories some of the old time um, uh, inspectors who were you know, quizzing these, the, the would be yeah. abbeys. Some of them are horrible. Oh, yeah. One of them, his idea of, you know, to pick out two, you know, two points for you to find a route from, it was to throw a dart, throw two darts at a map. <laughs> and uh, this, this guy who had this happen to him, he said, that's completely unfair. <laughs> the inspector said, all right, then I'll let you throw the darts. <laughs> And I, I, the, the the guy in the film, it was, it, which was based on a real person, used to stick two pencils up his nostrils or do whatever he could to put them off. Oh yeah, because you know <laughs> they, they would actually try to challenge the people to to yeah, yeah. Uh, upset them and, right. and annoy them, and and you know uh, uh, because being able to deal with the public is also part of the, the job. I mean, it, it's yeah. there is no other city in the world that has. Um, these kind of standards for their cab drivers it's, it's incredible always take or, a or has such an old cabbing uh history it goes back to the 17th century it does not yeah. the knowledge yeah. but the but but london cabbies well the knowledge has been going for for well over 100 years isn't it well absolutely over, well you over. know when you think about those those you know sherlock holmes hop, hopping in the handsome cab to go off and yeah. find somebody absolutely. those drivers knew, had the knowledge i know i know don't think people realize that look yeah. i would imagine you're itching to get back on an aircraft and onto the next story following your time um, on the bike in England no oh, 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 <laughs> I've not? really gotten quite you know uh, this is this has made me into quite a homebody actually I mean interesting I, you know part of me misses the, I mean I, I miss I miss the income obviously because you know <laughs> I need to earn a living but you know I I've become so uh much of a home I mean I, I really enjoy the travel I do in the mornings on my bicycle you know you've the, seen the dawn chorus I mean hearing the dawn chorus the mm. the, the sunrise exploring these little lanes the whole sense of, of being, um, of traveling in, 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 like I said, the, the old fashioned way of traveling where actually miles meant something. They weren't just things that vanished, you know, in an aircraft. I, you know, that's really, I find it very fulfilling. And in, in it, part of me doesn't really miss actually getting on a plane. So it's probably not the thing to say, but. <laughs> But I mean, pro yeah. projects-wise, a lot of photographers have talked about projects and finding projects in this time and finding things to do with their time, projects being that thing. I, I would imagine you'd be the first photographer, explorer, writer, national geo man to say, look, there's loads of stuff on your doorstep. Find it, shoot it. Absolutely. I've learned you know, so much, not in just the geography or the, or the town layouts. But, you know, I, I know the street corners now where the light is going to fall in a certain way. I know how the, you know, how the mist will rise in the marsh and, and, the, and the lights and, and the, you know, the, the, the beautiful light that comes you know, in the morning. The, you know, it, 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 there is so much to see. Mm. And, and, and so, you know, when you travel like this locally, I mean, all of, all of my shots are within a 10-mile radius of where I live. I mean, radius, you know, not necessarily, I mean, I may have ridden further than that distance-wise to get there. But if you're looking at actual, you know, point to point radius, all within a 10 mile radius of home, um, there is so much you can learn about uh, where you live. I mean, on you know, Becks Hill on Sea, which is a, a little seaside town about four miles away. I know it. You know, I had no idea that there was once an attempt at the land speed record along the promenade there. Wow. In 1902, some guy, in a, some French guy in a steam powered vehicle <laughs> called the Easter Egg tried making it. But you know, yeah. It, because I'm I'm going along slowly, looking at things, stopping, reading little signposts, little old plaques, and then coming back and looking things up. Um, you know, you, you learn so many little details about um, things that you just simply pass by every day. One of the images I shot uh, for this uh, series looks uh, very much calls to mind Edward Hopper's painting. Um, Oh, Nighthawks. the one in the blue light. Yeah, and it's you know you see that kind of it looks you know the shop and the it does all lit yeah. up against 
Yeah. And it looked very much, but I had never noticed how that resembled Nighthawk until I was, uh, you know, peddling along one morning. I thought, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, to get that shot, I made multiple visits to that, to that street corner. Uh, over a period of months. Yeah, I read it was about three or four times before you eventually got the shot, wasn't it? Oh, more, it was. It was probably more than that. I was mean, it? Wow. Um, I, I did three or four times, and I got a shot I was kind of happy with. And I looked at it you know, about a month later and thought, nah. And it, I, I probably six or eight times altogether uh, before I finally got one that I, I don't think I'm going to improve on. Uh, I, mean, I, I can still see things I would like to do better, but <laughs> realistically, I just don't think I can. But um. Yeah, you just see these 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 things, and like I said, you have to be willing to come back and um, make multiple trips. But again, that's part of the the thrill of it is is in, in the challenge to to get something you know really stunning that make people look at you know where the, where you know in my particular area, you know people who will see it that it just looks a whole lot different than they might have might have thought there's more to be seen than just going by at 35 miles in a car my thanks to roth smith i will of course include pictures from this story and links to his work in the website show notes and that's it for today keep sending your questions or feedback to studio at photography show so that i can feature you in the mailbag edition which is the friday photo walk Remember, you can also send in pictures from your own photo walks to appear on the episode's show page online, with uh, links to more of your work too. Wednesday, Robert Gumpert has made an extraordinary 13 years of pictures in American county jails, photographing hundreds of portraits of those serving time, but going a step further and recording their stories in audio with their portraits. It's about the way you treat us while we here. It's not about what we here for or how long we gonna be. It's dehumanizing. And my brother comes to visit me like once. Oh, he only came to see me once, but that, that's how I find out the news. And he's trying to get married this month. I'm gonna miss it probably. I wish I was outside. All my people and all the things that I hold dear or outside. Roberts is here Wednesday. Though if you're a patron of the show, a supporter for the price of that fancy latte and very sweet cake a month, tomorrow I thought I'd share my own sound setup for similar stories, for making audio. And we're, we're going to use a, a series of microphones, most very budget actually, to help you understand how you can bring your stories to life with sound. Music on the show was from artlist.io. And I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.